Thanks for rising up, I'm Dawn Ennis. With me today, a guest I've been trying to get for two years, finally here, finally available, finally talking to all of us in West Hartford, Mayor Sherry Cantor. Three years in term and up for re-election. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you nice so much. Now, I want to start right off the bat with, there is an election coming up, and we're just like in the middle of the beginning of summer. Mm -hmm. We can't even think about November, but you have that on your mind, I'm sure. Yes, sure. Now tell me, tell me what's going to be happening in the election this year. So the, this is municipal election year. Uh, it's an off, sort of an off year, you know, from a lot of the major elections. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, it, we do get lowered voter turnout, yet this is an election that really matters to your lives. It, it is education, it's front yard services, it's your day-to-day -day life, it's how your town is run. Um, so these are important elections and I hope that people pay attention. This, so Board of Education, a portion of the Board of Education will be up. They rotate, they have a four-year term, so half of them are up and half were running again. Whether someone, there may be vacancies and so there may be more open spots uh, depending on that announcement will be made in a couple of weeks. So, um, and on the council, similar, everybody, uh, we all actually, we all run two year terms. So the whole slate will run. Uh, there are expected to be an, six Republicans, six Democrats, potentially some unaffiliated voters. We don't know about that. Uh, and then people will vote for six people and the top six, uh, the top nine vote getters are, are on the council. It's a confusing actually process because uh, mayors don't run, We, uh, if you're the mayor, you don't run for mayor, you run at large. We have about 65,000 people in town. Uh, so it's a lot of ground to cover, a lot of people to talk to. Um, and so, uh, but the council right now, we have, the Democrats have a super majority, which is six, and minority representation laws for the state of Connecticut is you can only have six of one party. And so uh, the other three uh, uh, seats are Republican seats, um, but they don't have to be, they can be other party affiliations. It's just, you can only have a maximum of one party. Now, I think, you know, I'm an alternate representative for District 1 in the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And at our last meeting, we were talking about how some of our Republican council members haven't really been on board. And your name came up a couple times because people were saying, well, what Mayor Cantor wants is for us to find common ground. Mm -hmm. How do you do that with people who don't want to have their own proposals? They just want to say no. Mm -hmm. So it, it is difficult. We do see Many things we, we look, we all care about the town. We all, this is our home. Some of them, some of the people, them, some of us on the council have grown up here. Some of us are, you know, have been here 10 years or 15, 15 years or 20 years, right. right? And we call them a newbie. <laughs> no, but um, Feels I'm that way teasing. sometimes. I know, sure. it's a little, no. it's a little weird. But, um, but we all very much care about the community and the town. And so everybody is coming at it from that perspective. So. And we have to respect that. People, it's a volunteer position. Uh, I, I dedicate a lot of time to this. Um, I can't expect that everybody's going to do what I can and are and am able to do. Um, but uh, but our my colleagues all contribute a, a good amount of time to it. Some more than others. Um, and there has to be respect for different opinions. Do you think there is? Um, I, for the most part, I do. Uh, it's rare that something gets personal at the table. Uh, I think my role as being the president of the council, which is really the technical term, is to set the tone and to make sure that we treat each other with respect. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't get heated. And uh, again, you can disagree without being disagreeable. I think that that uh, it has been challenged at the federal level, a national level, um, I, not so much necessarily at the state level, partly because it's one party, <laughs> I think, that's out there. But, but, but somewhat I, at the state level, um, we have gotten, there has been nasty conversations. But, we're better because we have to answer to why we're being challenged. So um, there are winning, uh, you know, there's certain things that the Republicans are going to lose if they vote with us. <laughs> and so it's just sort of understood for the last, I think, 10 years, there has not been one Republican that's voted for a town budget. So, you know, we that's an expectation. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, we're we don't have 
uh, input necessarily. This last budget actually was, I think, the first time that we had a specific suggestion, which was um, actually eliminating the paramedic program. Um, which actually would have cost the town on budget day a million dollars. So I, I strongly, I, I, we disagreed with that position. We actually had consultants that came in and have talked to us. We're actually having a formal report uh, on, the, on that. Um, but I think that the um, Republican Party in general believes in smaller government. There, we actually, I think as Democrats, uh, believe that there are critical things we need to provide to our community. But I agree we need to do them in the most efficient and effective way. We don't, taxes are high, mm -hmm. and we don't want to burden our taxpayers. But if we don't do things now, it can cost more later, and we've seen that happen. Um, but, but compromise is a dirty word all across the country right, right now. Right. And I, I, I sense that even on the Democratic side, nobody wants to give an inch. It's almost seen as if, if I give up, then I'm not doing my job. This is such a change for me from what I grew up when Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill would mm. make things happen, even though they were on different sides. That kind of era of politics seems to be gone forever. Even at the local level, it just seems so poisoned. Is there anything that you think we can do on the local level to get people to be more engaged? Because that's what the whole point yes. of this show is. How can you rise up? How can we rise above our pettiness. Yes, and I, I think if you were to look at us behind closed doors, and even at the table, um, but more so behind closed doors, we get along really well, and we respect each other, like I said, because everybody's coming from a place of caring about their community. So what I think the message gets hijacked on social media, and when you have a perspective of somebody, uh, and there have been occasions where there's been, a, I, more so on the Republican side I see, there's been a message that's come across on social media, and it's replayed and replayed and replayed, and it's not accurate. It's not a full picture. It's not, it, you don't have it in context. And it's misrepresenting and what it's actually misrepresenting. is happening. Exactly. And so that, I think, is a, an, a, it does a, a disservice to our residents because, yes, you might disagree, but let's talk about why you have this position and why we believe this. And, and you miss all that in this one-line messaging that Twitter uh, and and that's and we've seen that you know it's become hyper hyper uh, kind of dynamic on the federal level and probably all the way down. I think less in this community than many other communities. Oh, and I, I, I really do. Now, one of the things that I think that um, will bring us all together is happening this weekend. Mm -hmm. Celebrate West Absolutely. Hartford. Yeah. And this is um, the third one under your term mm -hmm. as mayor. Yes. And what's different this year? What can people expect? I'm really excited about going. Well, there's tradition. So it's been, I think we're at the 23rd Celebrate. Um, so there's many things that happened prior to me. And uh, and it's this is actually, even though it's town run, and it benefits actually, the benefit goes to our social services organizations in, in town, the town that cares, uh, all our social services. Uh, so it's really a good cause. Um, this year for me, I'm a little brokenhearted because I run the road race and I tore my ACL skiing and oh. I had surgery. So I I can't run the road race this year, but um, a lot is weather dependent. Uh, what happens? But we have traditional. We have talent in the band shell. We've got a juried craft arts fair that is really, really amazing. Just in that, in of itself, is great. A road race that, in of itself, is great. Uh, again, all the entertainment is great, and then you have rides and you have all this food. All so the food. you put it all together, and it really is such a fun, fun two-day event. And I, I really hope everybody comes out and enjoys. I, the forecast is looking perfect for Saturday. Sunday is a little questionable, but you know, a lot can happen when it's cloudy out. Maybe a little drizzle. We just don't want downpours, but. What I think is fun is that it attracts people from all over. All over. It's not just a West Hartford celebration. Oh, it's regional. Yeah. And it really does show what West Hartford's all about. Absolutely. Um, the booths, the um, different interactions. Um, my kids have grown up in this town. Um, we've been here 15 years, and I can't wait to take them back. And 
maybe a little bit too big for some of the rinds. Yeah. And um, you may have to give sack. them a little money and let them go on their own. I know I remember that going, and it did go kind of fast. You know, the food and the rinds and they the tickets. Do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's exactly. like, whoa, where'd that money yeah, go? Yeah, exactly. So that's just one aspect of what we're talking about today. Now. That's a positive. Tell me why construction in West Hartford is going to be a positive because I swear to goodness, every time I turn around, there's a road crew, there's a road closure, there's a detour, there's a pothole. Yeah. I mean, I know it's the summer of construction, but what's going on, Mayor? So, well, we, we're, we're a developed, fully developed town. We're an older community. Much of our, our development happened a long time ago. We have to keep up with it. So we, we have a routine of, of construction that we do automatically. And then there's acute things that come up that need to be taken care of. Uh, or a bigger project that needs to be taken care of. We juggle a lot. We're a, we really are a small city and uh, we have a limited construction season. And with the wet spring, we could have started to do maybe uh, some projects and been done with them before. but. The season is short if we have a very wet, cold spring. Which we did. Which we did. And so, you know, now we're, uh, you know, we're heading into that the really heavy season where we don't have the same school traffic or the same level of morning traffic because everybody's on a little bit different schedule with summer schedules and vacations and all that. So it really is a good time to have that construction done. Um, but we're, you know, unfortunately it gets pushed a little bit later um, if you have bad weather. Uh, and with the way that our, our winter was, we had some super frigid cold. We had the Arctic uh, circle actually that has been sagging. So we've gotten some really sub-zero, which is really hard on the roads. The fluctuation in temperatures is almost worse on the roads than if it was steadily cold. And that's why so, I'm seeing so and many models? that's models? why, yes, yes, wow. yes. Um, so, you know, hopefully we will continue to research other materials that are more resilient uh, to those fluctuations because with uh, climate change, with, with things that we were seem to have longer periods of wetness, longer periods of dry, longer periods of cold, you know, that severe cold and then generally warmer temperatures. So all of these things really do have uh, a t take a toll on our infrastructure. That's amazing that you are at this local level considering how climate change is affecting us. Because oh, yes. I don't know if our state or our federal government are as acutely aware of what it's going to do to our environment. Oh, no, we, we are concerned about it. We talk about it a lot. We've had uh, excessive periods of, of rain that have really put a lot of pressure on our and our, our system. So, uh, yeah, it is something that we think about quite a bit. Now, the whole Park Road thing with 84, I know that's a state project, I believe, is that right? So, it was 80% federal funded, actually. Really? 10% state Trump. funded. Well, it was prior to President Trump. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually Senator Murphy was very instrumental well, in getting us that him. funding. 10% uh, state and 10% town, so municipal funding. So that was a project that was primarily funded, you know, again, by the federal government. But it it's was, not over, it's still going it's on. It's not over, right. What's going on now? So there's some improvements in on the, once you get off the exit ramp, to the more local local traffic and how the flow will, will work better. Got it, and the Park Road, Trout Brook intersection, that's all still going on yes. too? And, yes. And then, I've been reading about Main Street. Yes. North Main is going to be seeing a big facelift. What's that all about? So actually we have a 100-year-old bridge uh, that needs to be uh, repaired and and, um, and maintained. And so we did get, it was in the budget actually for the past couple of years, uh, but the funding never came final. Well, it wasn't, it didn't get through the final approvals. This year it, it, it is scheduled to get through final approval. Uh, it's been some. It's something that we've needed to do. Uh, it will narrow North Main Street. It will also um, allow us to look at traffic flows. North Main Street is a very, very tight street with four lanes. Uh, there is our police keep a very close eye on that street. Uh, the average speed is over 50 miles an hour. People are crazy. Yeah, it's like a race and course. so it really should never have been four lanes. Uh, we probably will be. We are looking at a three-lane model uh, where we'll be one lane each way with a shoulder uh, so the people won't be running walking feeling like they ha are on a highway uh, and then um, and then left turn so the flows should be better um, but we're going to be doing a study of that in conjunction with the bridge project and then after the bridge project and the goal is to improve safety of our 
um, you know, of all of our residents and people even that drive through town uh, to reduce the number of accidents uh, or induce speeds. Biggest complaint we hear all through town is people drive too fast. I all live over. off Albany and that <clears throat> stretch between Steel Road and Trapbrook mm -hmm. is a King Philip so Drive. so do I. <laughs> it, is, it is like, I know you're a neighbor yeah. of mine. Yes. It is like the Autobahn and people love to see how fast they can go just to get to the next light and sit next to me and say, see, you didn't get very far. <laughs> but And that's it. I don't you, understand. You feel like, geez, on a two lane, you can pass somebody and you're going faster, but you're not. It, it, the study is that it, it, if you go to, from two lanes to one lane, and there's been a lot of information on this in a local you know, obviously if you're on a highway, it's different when you have long stretches, but when you have lights and you're in a, a city center or municipal road grid structure, you don't, you don't go far and you do get stopped and it's not, it will cost you literally 60 seconds, yet you can be so much safer and you can actually improve the quality of life of all the users, meaning people crossing the street, people walking, people uh, with baby strollers, uh, people in wheelchairs, people people running or cycling all of those things since and you can't change people's behavior though what can we do to make changes so that they're forced to do something is it stop signs is it more lights well actually that's governed a lot by the state believe it or not where you can put up a stop sign know and that. yes yes so there's we ha you have to submit data and it a lot of times doesn't qualify everybody will say put a speed bump put a stop sign put a, and there's pros and cons to all of it and much of it is regulated speed bumps are a real problem for emergency Emergency vehicles. When you are taking a fire truck over a speed bump at a quick speed, and you need to get to uh, an emergency, that can take out the bottom of a fire truck. So uh, it's not there. We do have to train people to to behave differently. Don't drive so fast. When you're teaching your kids to drive, honestly, that's when you feel it to the core. You're like, everybody, slow down, and honking. Tell me and about honking. it. I know. You see the signs all over town. My daughter drives now, so yes, yeah. <laughs> Beware! Yeah. Um, those signs that make you the smile. smile. Yes. Is that yes. working? Is that a solution? It is. No, we, uh, we had looked at that a while ago, and um, they're solar powered, which is great. Um, and the, the, this is something that's been done in Europe for a little while, and it was positive reinforcement goes a long way. So uh, we really just need to be aware. Our cars are heavier than ever. They're uh, they drive fast. They're smooth. Great engineering, but it allows you to go faster without feeling it, you know? And then my parents used to buy, you know, would, would have the big wide cars that, you know, you felt every bump. We don't feel that in our cars now, you know? And especially if you have a small SUV or a big SUV. So we need to remind people, you're going 50. It's just a 35 mile an hour speed limit. How do we make the police department so that they are um, focused more on policing and not on gotcha? So, you know, there's a little bit of um, those signs that are reminders and the, the, the oftentimes what we actually did with our police is that they don't have to come back into headquarters to do the work of inputting information. They can park in a driveway uh, and be a speed control without really truly being all in on speed control, yet their presence is enough. Like if they see somebody apparently, you know, really going fast or something, they can take off. When you but, see that police car. When you see that police car, it is a, a control, a right? It, it is a deterrent to speeding. So That's a change, yeah, is it? It is. It is a change, yeah. Wow, that's So great. that's uh, a way to use our resources in a more efficient way. On Christmas Day, my oldest son was involved in a uh, accident with a driver who was unlicensed, hmm. unregistered, <laughs> uninsured, and they were great. They were mm -hmm. fabulous. I mean, thank God for airbags and seatbelts. Mm -hmm. My son is fine. Mm -hmm. But how could we possibly get rid of our paramedics? What would the idea be that we would have other towns work with us? So no, right now, uh, well, uh, two years ago, we the, the fire uh, department, many of them are already licensed EMTs, right? So they're, they already respond um, to calls and provide medical emergency medical. So what happens is that uh, we licensed out for paramedic service, which is a little step up and transport with AMR. Um, our fire... A private company. A private company, right. So uh, over actually 20 years this had been, been discussed, and uh, since I've been on the council a long time, it had been a continuous conversation that we have expertise in-house and we could take that in-house. 
all of the, everything didn't line up um, at the same time until a couple of years ago, we actually made the change, worked with the unions uh, to get the, make sure that people had the right training. The model wasn't 100% well, it, it was it was faulty in a way because unfortunately they were responding in fire trucks, and that's oh. not the way to respond. They were already responding in fire trucks to EMT calls, but if you had the increased calls and the paramedic calls as well, uh, that made it there. W there have been a large increase in calls. Not the best way to operate. So we not applied efficient. for right. Yeah. So we applied for a grant. We did uh, receive a a fly vehicle. So things are more efficient. We actually, in this budget, did all, also, um, we had a study done on how we could do this more efficiently. We have two more vehicles coming in. So we're, but we're not gonna have vehicles. And it was part of the negotiation in the fire trucks because part of the reason was firefighters have to be able to respond to fires and there's a minimum manning requirement. So if they're on a paramedic call yet there's a fire, they might have to be diverted once that call is over to a fire with four person people on a truck. So we had to have some flexibility. So we had to go through all of these union negotiation uh, contract uh, variation to make sure that we had the ability to do both. Uh, and this contract actually allowed us with the most flexibility that we have ever had with the fire department to provide that level of service. We were paying, it was a $300,000 contract, but we were paying a reduced rate because their response times were not as good as we uh -huh. actually wanted them to be. So our rep response times have improved. We have five people on 24 seven. We didn't have that. We had one and a half to two people on. Wow. Uh, and so we've got a much better service for a reduced rate. We also are billing insurance companies for our service and we're making about, we're bringing in revenue of about six to $700,000. That's important. So that's important. So the swing this year would have been a million dollars if we didn't, if we didn't have the paramedic service. If we took the EMT part away from our firefighters that they were not even uh, responding to uh, providing CPR or something, then we would really be, we would just be providing fire, but we would have to have somebody do that. So we would have to be paying more money outside. Another so, contract. Right. Yeah. And so it, it's, it is complicated, but we really do believe we're providing the best service for our residents with incredible expertise. And these people care about our community. It's a little different than having an outside company come in and do what they do and leave, right? These people are entrenched in the community, part of our community. This is where your taxes go yeah. and my taxes and your taxes. Right. And I, but again, I think it's a better way to, it's a better delivery of service at less cost to the taxpayer. So Now, in terms of the thing that I think everyone in Connecticut is talking about, tolls. Oy. Tolls. <laughs> tolls seems to be like buzzword. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand? And does the town have a say in whether we have tolls or not? We don't really have a say. That's what we elect our state representatives to do to deal with um, you know, to deal with the statewide issues of revenue and infrastructure, just like we worry about it on our on the town level, we are concerned. We're we're connected though, because what's gonna happen if if the budget gets cut on the state level, if they don't have the money, we get about seven percent of our budget is from the state. So our taxpayers, the only way we can collect revenue is through property taxes, and our property taxes are residential property taxes, more so than other communities, um, which we're working on. But uh, so it, it falls on us, right? Mm -hmm. So if the state doesn't have the money, it's going to fall on us. So there's a connection. Uh, the other thing is are the quality of life and attracting businesses. It, it, congestion on highways is a pro or a con. You know, you either it's sufficient or it's not. And there are accidents that affect our community. And there's aging infrastructure that our West Hartford residents drive over every day. You know, if it's not safe, it needs to be fixed. So how do we address it? I think every I think we've made a lot of mistakes in the state of Connecticut that we've diverted funding that should have gone to infrastructure and our roads and it was taken out of, we were using relying on an aging infrastructure, uh, an, age, an, a, a, an aging, um, I'm sorry, model on gas tax. Our cars became more efficient. <laughs> 
you know, with not enough gas tax money coming in. Yeah. So this should have been addressed a long time ago. Um, I do believe if the tolls are structured correctly and committed to the roads that they're they're on, and then money can be spent on mass transit to even take more pressure off the roads, and then you know, and, and so and we are more fiscally responsible and understand that we have to deal with this aging infrastructure problem, then that is probably the model that would work and could work. But it's it's something that, again, every state around us on the eastern seaboard, actually the south, even the, you know, Texas, all over Texas, we were, uh, my husband has an office there. It, 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 there are tolls everywhere. Electronic tolls. Electronic tolls. And my grand, my husband's grandfather was a toll collector, actually. <laughs> and uh, it was scary, sitting in a toll booth and having cars whiz by. You know, I mean, or pay and, or, you know, and Breathing that accident exhaust. was terrible. <laughs> but yeah. those, those models have changed, and so. And will we get a discount, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the structure, again, they have a lot of work to do to make sure that they, uh, that everything's aligned. From what I understand, and I don't have the bill in front of me, I don't know all the ins and outs of it, so, you know, I may say it's faulty, but the federal government has more control over toll roads than any other road, and that money has to go be invested back into those roads, and the plan is to relieve congestion on our major arterial roads. We see it in West Hartford, so, that's for sure. Yeah. Last question. How's your relationship with Governor Lamont? Are we going to be in a good position a year from now, two years from now, or is West Hartford still trying to fight for our little slice of the state funding. So, uh, my, actually, believe it or not, my relationship with Governor Malloy, Malloy was very good. Um, I think there was a perception of West Hartford that is different. Um, my relationship with Governor Lamont is very good. He is, they're both really committed public servants and work really, really hard to make Connecticut a better place. Whether you agree or not, I respect them for their hard work. I don't agree on every decision, but that's okay. But I want to make I, what I really am passionate about is West Hartford is very, very diverse. We are not like the Gold Coast. We're not even, you know, we're not in the same uh, demographic um, category as Glastonbury, Avon, Simsbury, Farmington. We are a small city. We're, you know, and we have challenges that. Uh, some of those other communities don't have. We have a, uh, we're densely populated. We don't have land for further development. So, and because we've been successful and there's not a lot of models like us throughout the United States of America, we should not be punished for our success. And if we were failing, we would get more help. And that's what I fight for. Thank you for being my <laughs> guest today. You're welcome. We look forward to having you back. Let's talk after the election. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks for having me. And thank you for rising up. Make sure you go to our website for more information about all the topics we talked about. Riseupwithdawn.com. See you next time. Don't forget to rise up.